when I was a kid growing up in Staten Island, New York, my father was a columnist for the New York Daily News. In the late 70s, he wrote for the Brooklyn section. And at that time in his life, he would read a lot of books about Brooklyn. I remember his bookcase being filled with books about Brooklyn. He died in 2010 on a recent trip home to see my mom. She now lives up in New Hampshire. I was looking in uh, their bookcase. Now, really, it was his. And I saw that it had dwindled down to really only about, I don't know, maybe 50 books. But one book that really called out to me was A Walker in the City by Alfred Kazin. The cover is gorgeous on this particular edition. And um, I sat down to read it and, and was, was enthralled. Um, also the name, I mean, Alfred Kazin was, uh, you know, one of the New York intellectuals, along with like Mary McCarthy, Lionel and Diana Trilling, uh, Harold Rosenberg, and perhaps he was most known for literary criticism. He made his name with a book called On Native Grounds in 1942, when he was 27 years old, which basically he just, you know, wrote about um, the value of, of certain books in the American canon. By American, I mean, you know, North American, specifically the United States. In fact, when he died in 1998 at 83 years old, the New York Times obituary quoted Philip Roth as saying that Alfred Kazin was the best American reader of American literature in this century, which is no small praise coming from um, coming from Philip Roth. Uh, but Alfred Kazin also wrote three memoirs. The first was this, A Walker in the City, which was published in 1951. Then he wrote, um, starting out in the 30s, in 1965, and then he wrote New York Jew in 1978. Um, A Walker in the City is really about his childhood, about growing up in Brownsville, Brooklyn. He grew up in Brownsville, Brooklyn in the 20s and 30s during the Great Despre Depression. His mother and father were both immigrants from Tsarist Russia. Yiddish was spoken in their household. Um, it is a book about being a blue-collar, working-class New Yorker. Um, his mother was a dressmaker. His father was a house painter. There's a great line at the beginning of A Walker in the City when Alfred Kazin writes, It puzzled me when I came to read in books that Jews are a shrewd people, especially given to commerce and banking, for all the Jews I knew had managed to be an exception to that rule. I mean, that's just a great line. It has just the right amount of irony. It's just educational, you know? So yeah, it's a book about working class New York, but a working class New York that had a tremendous respect for books and for intellectual endeavor. Um, the edition that I have also has these great um, illustrations by Marvin Bilek or Bilek. Um, these pieces were originally published in the New Yorker and commentary magazines. You know, one of the thing, one of the things that struck me also when I read the New York Times obituary was that it said that Kazin was dismissive of uh, the Beat Generation. And that struck me as strange because I would say that A Walker in the City has a lot in common with on the Road. Um, on the Road was written in 1957, six years after A Walker in the City. You know, there is another great book which I should review here one day called Advertisements for Myself by Norman Mailer. There's a section in that book where he sort of sums up his contemporaries or also the living pillars of American literature at that time. And he writes about Kerouac. He says that Kerouac... Um, um, he says that, what is it? He says, at his best, his love of language had an ecstatic flux. And he writes, to, um, to judge his worth, it is better to see him as an action painter or a bard. 
I just think that's so perceptive, you know? Not only about someone like Kerouac, but also about maybe Charles Bukowski or Hunter S. Thompson. You know, writers who have tremendous literary merit, but are also often dismissed by the literati because they also have fans outside the literati. They have a much sort of wider reach than the average literary writer. Um, and so they're dismissed and, you know, literary snobbery kind of poo-poos them, but they shouldn't be poo-pooed. And I think that, you know, this book also has the love that Alfred Kazin has for the English language also has an ecstatic flux. And there is a sense of him being a kind of bard and an action painter as he returns to his old neighborhood of Brownsville and sort of recreates it for us, both in the present moment and in the past. I would consider this book the best kind of travel memoir. You know, it really takes us to a place and immerses us in it. Um, the book is separated into four parts. The first part is called um, From the Subway to the Synagogue, where he walks us back into his old neighborhood, which has changed a bit, but not so much, growing up in the tenements in Brownsville. The synagogue, too, he makes a great comparison between his synagogue and the local cinema called the stadium. I mean, just that alone is worth reading the book. Okay, the second section is called... Um, the kitchen, because that's where his mother would make dresses and people would come in to, have, to try on their dresses from, the door was always open, people would come in, try on dresses from the neighborhood and from the, from the building. The third section is where I would say the book sort of bored me in places because it was just being descriptive. You know, I think he has to give more. He has to give some sort of character description or tell a story or some kind of commentary. And then the last section of the book is called Summer. Uh, the way to Highland Park, where he sort of comes into his own as an intellectual, as a 16 and 17 year old. Um, it starts out with him kind of describing, you know, how as a, as a child, I think he says, as a child, I always thought we lived at the end of the world. You know, um, how his people were immigrants camped at the city's back door. Or there's a great line where he says, um, we were of the city, but somehow not in it which I can relate to as a Staten Islander. You know, not that I grew up in tenement houses, far from it, but, you know, we were a part of the city that was considered um, marginalized from the cosmopolitan and glorious or um, shiny hole, W-H-O-L-E, that New York City was. Also, there's some great stuff when he remembers, you know, being in public school and, you know, how hard his parents worked how little they thought of their own lives or you know how they worked in a rage to put us him and his sister on a level above them how they married how they had gotten married to make us possible and how he was expected to shine for them to redeem the how does he put it the constant anxiety of their existence, how he was supposed to be a monument of their liberation from the shame of being what they were. There's no sense in this book of, you know, feeling proud of being a marginalized people. There's no sort of, there's no contempt for, you know, privilege or for prosperous peoples. Clearly, you know, Alfred Kazin's family wanted to rise out of their marginalized state and become prosperous and to become prominent peoples, which Alfred Kazin did. Clearly he did. Um, also, just, you know, the way he describes walking in the city where the book has this kind of, you know, ecstatic tone where, you know, walking through the city, especially at dusk, how it was a corridor back and back into that old New York where he would be stopped in his tracks by the abysmal nostalgia of the city as it had once been when Theodore Roosevelt had been the mighty police commissioner. I don't know. You know, also, I mentioned Philip Roth before, but there's a scene in this book where he's describing 
a guy named Mr. Solovey and the Solovey family who also lived in Brownsville. And it reminded me of a Bernard Malamud story. Personally, I just think Bernard Malamud is just a much better writer than Philip Roth. I think Philip Roth got kind of diluted when he became an ambitious writer wanting to write the great American novel where I felt that Bernard Malamud was content with being who he was as an artist and so that everything that Malamud wrote, every story and every novel just kind of, it throbbed with him. It throbbed with who he was. And you know, in this section on the Salaby family where he writes about this Mr. Salaby who you know, let his business go to ruin because he just wanted to sit in the back reading books, losing himself in ideas and stories. How he'd be, he would be contemptuous of his customers. And to young Alfred Kazin, he was almost heroic for sort of following his bliss, you know? And there's a line where he says his life seemed to say that success didn't matter. Also, there's this great stuff on, a, on his friend named David in the last section. David lived in the worst part of the Brownsville tenements. And there was his mother kind of yellow with cancer on the couch. And yet David would invite all his friends over to speak about politics and books. And um, all he wanted to do was get back to reading The Wasteland, that poem by T.S. Eliot. And the way that uh, Alfred Kazin describes him, he says... Mm, that poem that he, his friend David, loved with such breathless admiration that I seemed to see him sucking on every phrase like a lozenge that he could not bear to swallow. What a great sentence, no? Also, there's a great section, maybe for me especially, having grown up in New York as Catholic, my parents were devout Catholics, but I grew up in a section that was quite integrated. In my public schools, we had, you know, you had Catholics and Jews and Protestants. That was integrated in my section of New York. Um, but he describes his admiration, Alfred Kazin's admiration for Jesus Christ. Um, he describes um, Jesus Christ as misunderstood by his own, like me, but the very embodiment of everything I had waited so long to hear from a Jew. Um, yeah, man, so would I recommend this book? Absolutely, you know? Like I said, it's travel literature at its best, um, bringing us to a place in a time that has disappeared, but which had great value and which can teach us a lot, you know, one of the things that books can do, like nothing else, it can sort of stimulate the imagination to live a place with all five senses. Videos can't do that. Films can't really do that. You know, only books can really do that. You know, I love books that do best what only books can do. And that's what a walker in the city does. Check it out. Alfred Kazin, you know, a name that shouldn't be forgotten.